Right, okay, so good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We're very pleased to welcome Graham O'Mahony of uh, Asbestos Training Limited. He has kindly agreed to deliver this session and I'll shortly hand over to him. Um, but before I do, I just want to mention a few things. So firstly, for those of you who haven't attended one of our IOSH webinars, I am Ben Pollard and I take care of the technical aspects of these sessions. So any problems and I shall try to assist as best as I can. So on your screen, most likely located at the top left hand side, you'll notice a small bar with some written options on them, which are chat and Q&A. If you have any technical issues or audio problems and need to message me at any point, please use the chat option. If you have any specific questions for Graham relating to the content of the session, please use the Q&A option and ask your questions here. Uh, we'll try and run through these questions possibly uh, halfway through and then at the end, uh, but predominantly most likely at the end. Um, and we'll aim to tackle as many of these as possible. If we do run out of time and there are any questions remaining, uh, we'll look at these after the webinar uh, and try to aim to post some written answers online with a, a copy of the recording. So with all that said, uh, I'm now going to hand you over to Graham and I hope that you all enjoy the session. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, thank you Ben, thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Graham Amani, as uh, Ben's al already introduced me. Um, I work for a company called Asbestos Training Limited. However, I am the current chair of uh, UCATA, so this presentation is on behalf of UCATA uh, the UK Asbestos Training Association, who I'm sure you have uh, have heard of uh, in the past. Uh, just a brief um, background about myself, how I got into asbestos training and uh, what, I, what I sort of generally do. Um, I started my career as a plumbing and heating engineer many, many years ago working for um, the uh, British Rail when we did actually have a British Rail. Um, but of course, progression from that, I moved on to doing a national certificate in building studies and civil engineering and then obviously moved to um, a building surveyor for a local authority. My role as the, uh, the building surveyor was dealing with aid adaptations works, building works, refurbishment works, etc. I then progressed um, in the late 1990s, well before obviously the duty to manage, to uh, the asbestos surveyor for the local authority. Uh, my role there was to survey uh, council buildings, um, schools, hot, um, schools, um, various different properties. Um, and of course, I learned quite a lot about locations of asbestos and of course the asbestos management, but it was very much in its infancy. So my role then progressed again to um, not so much the duty holder, that's what I'm going to be talking about today, but certainly dealing with duty holders and of course um, in readiness for the duty to manage that came out a few years later. Um, I decided to break away from local authority and started to work in the private sector as a consultant. Uh, delivering asbestos training courses and uh, dealing with consultancy uh, for mainly the licensed asbestos removal sector at the time and then of course the natural progression for the asbestos regulations was to move that into the construction sector and of course dealing with um, the construction industry, plumbers, carpenters, electricians etc. Um, so I've worked in the asbestos industry for over 20 years. Um, I've been training in the sector for nigh on 18, 19 years now and it's successful business um, ranging from basic asbestos awareness courses through to training the licensed asbestos removal contractors. Uh, my current uh, position within UCATA, uh, I've been with UCATA for seven years now, uh, originally um, started as a board director and then progressed on to the vice chair a few years ago and then I found myself in the position of the chair of the association. So uh, we have uh, another sort of 10 directors that sit with me on the, uh, on the board of directors and of course uh, UCATA is forever, forever progressing um, celebrating 10 years of its inception uh, in 2018. So the webinar uh, that I'll be presenting will be presented in two parts. Um, the, this first part will obviously be to relate to the duty holder and managing asbestos in buildings, uh, looking at the legislation obviously pertaining to that, a little bit of history behind the back of that. If we understand the history, then we understand obviously what we've got to try to do to achieve uh, compliance obviously with the, uh, the current regulations. Uh, one of the most um, questions um, we often get asked is identifying who the duty holder is and um, the role of that duty holder. Um, sometimes tends to be a bit slopey shoulders in the sense that nobody wants that job for whatever reason, but of course somebody has to take on that responsibility. So we'll look at that um, 
from from my opinion and i'm sure some of you may have some questions regarding uh, regarding who the duty holder is within uh, many of your organizations uh, we also need to look at what the duty holder has to do um, to obviously ensure compliance uh, how this can be achieved and then of course for some duty holders if they are chief execs etc uh, do they actually understand all about asbestos in most cases it's probably not so what they would generally do is they would delegate the responsibilities to what we often refer to as the appointed person so that's part one that's what obviously I'll be talking about and discussing today uh, part two will be a follow-on we haven't set a date for part two yet um, it may well be recorded uh, I may well come in and do that one live as well because there may be some questions that come from that but uh, part one looking at managing asbestos in buildings where part two is looking at asbestos management on sites such as uh, project managers such as who appoint in um, uh, the license removal contractors, maybe some nice non-license removal contractors. Um, so we look at how, how asbestos is removed, uh, how we can select the right contractor, do our due diligence, obviously the responsibility there. We need to make sure obviously we appoint the right person. Looking at site inspections, looking at how asbestos is, uh, is removed and then of course site documentation um, on completion of those projects so keep in touch with IOSH because they as I said they haven't set uh, we haven't set a date yet for part two um, but that hopefully will be uh, will be delivered very very soon so uh, if we just have a look at a quick background behind the legislation to asbestos management um, it all goes back to 1995 when there was a study done and it was recognized that the construction and maintenance sector were um, there's an alarming increase in people developing asbestos related diseases and of course that study showed that um, the plumbers, the carpenters, electricians, maintenance trades etc were regularly going in to disturb the fabric of the building and of course as such when they disturb the fabric of the building unknowingly disturbing asbestos containing materials. So in 1998 the health and safety executive started to move to implement the duty to manage. Um, it was very much in its infancy. Uh, when they amended the control of asbestos work regulations they brought the construction industry into those regulations uh, in 2000 uh, this was consulted on um, and there was a few a few issues with the consultation so it was sort of took, taken back in because it made reference to the employer employers didn't seem too happy with that responsibility so of course from that the role uh, was changed to the, uh, the duty holder it was written under the control of asbestos at work regulations in 2002 however obviously there's quite a lot of work involved in uh, managing asbestos and of course the HSE then decided to give an 18 month leading period for that to be enforced uh, as of May 2004 so in reality uh, we've had uh, legislation in place for uh, over 14 years um, possibly 16 years but enforceable for 14 years um, currently sitting at around about 5,500 deaths per year as the latest statistics obviously released from the HSE and for many many years 25% uh, of those trades uh, sorry 25% of the 5,500 uh, from the construction and trade industry which equates to about 1,400 trade operatives die every year from asbestos related diseases that equates to 26 trade operatives per week and the majority of those tend to be carpenters However, uh, statistics are showing plumbers, heating engineers, and of course, um, electricians as well. The remainder of the 75% um, are from the old traditional industries, um, such as the laggers, shipyard workers, dockers, manufacturers, and of course, uh, people traditionally working with asbestos five, six, seven days a week. So rough estimates are 105 people every week die from asbestos related diseases. Uh, those are the only uh, statistics we have. Now, some have argued that there may be more than that, but of course we can only work on the diagnosed statistics that uh, are released by the health and safety executive. So from the legislation back in 2002, enforced since 2004, um, the role that was uh, was defined is defined as the duty holder now obviously we've had two legislation changes since 2002 we had the car or the control of asbestos regulations 2006 that subsequently changed again in 2012 and of course the current ACOP L143 does actually state what the who the duty holder is uh, an extract from that is shown on the screen uh, it's the person or organization that has the main responsibility for maintenance or repair of non-domestic premises so key word there we're looking at <coughs> excuse me is uh, is the key key person responsible for the maintenance and quite rightly so if we consider obviously the history with regard to the 
um, trade operatives obviously dealing with uh, asbestos in buildings and unknowingly disturbing the fabric of the building on a regular basis. Just one thing to say about that, that it does actually state non-domestic premises. So it does, uh, it does not extend to domestic premises such as the uh, domestic house, um, but obviously does cover common parts in blocks of flats um, and um, housing multiple occupations, etc. But we'll look at that a little bit later when we define, obviously, the um, definition of a domestic premises and uh, the HSE's um, statement on that. Now, the duty holder may obviously be the owner, um, but of course what we've also got to look at is maybe some tenancy agreements or contracts that um, the owners have maybe with the, um, regarding the maintenance. But of course it may be the occupier or the landlord um, or a managing agent, but again it all comes back down to contracts. Now we do find that some of the very old tenancy agreements um, may not have any reference to asbestos, certainly new tenancy agreements that are being written asbestos is obviously um, a major part of that however in some cases it may also be the tenant um, but we need to again look at the contract that the tenant has with regards to their uh, their repairing uh, obligations and then in, again in some cases it may well be shared so it might not necessarily be the um, the, the tenant uh, it might be the landlord but we need to obviously um, uh, analyze as to who is uh, the key responsible for um, the maintenance and the responsibility of the, the building. So for example, uh, on the screen, the owner may rent out or lease workplace premises under agreements, but of course, if the tenants have the full repair and responsibilities for the maintenance and repair, then of course, the tenants obviously will be the duty holder in that case. So a couple of visuals to have a look at. Um, we have an owner, an occupier, obviously in the purple box there. The owner occupier obviously is going to be responsible for all the maintenance and all the repair within that uh, that building. Therefore, as such, the duty holder, it's very clearly laid down, um, they will be the duty holder uh, in that case. Now, another example, another visual we can have a look at there where we have the tenant is responsible for the internal fabric of the building. However, the landlord uh, retains the responsibility for the external and the structure. So um, obviously the tenant looks after the internals landlord main structure in this case who is the duty holder well it's quite simple again the duty holder uh, is the tenant for the internal whereas obviously the landlord will be responsible for the external external so there is a shared responsibility there and of course if the tenant wishes to carry out say uh, works which passes through the fabric of the building from internal to external then of course they would have to obviously liaise with the landlord in uh, in such situations because obviously the landlord would possibly have the knowledge and information as to the location and whereabouts of the asbestos containing materials. We can take this one step further where we have numerous tenants. Um, on the screen I've only just uh, listed six there but we could find there could be 65, there could be 80, there could be 100 such as in shopping centres etc. But again the landlord retains the responsibility for the external and of course the common or the, um, the shared parts such as the corridors, the lifts, uh, the car parking arrangements. So in this case, what we will find is that the tenants would be responsible for their own demise, i.e. the internal, or the landlord would still maintain that responsibility um, for, the, uh, for the externals. Now again, if landlords um, provide uh, the, or utilize the services of managing agents, and uh, depending on that contractual agreement, the managing agent may take on that responsibility um, as defined under the control of asbestos regulations. The regulations also go on to uh, mention about cooperation and the statement says that anybody who is not a duty holder but has information on or controls of the premises, they must obviously help the duty holder. So it does put a responsibility on not necessarily all towards the duty holder, alternative, or ultimately they will have the main responsibility, but anybody do, who does have that, uh, that knowledge, obviously they should be able to share that information and to assist in uh, the management. But that doesn't necessarily extend to paying um, or sharing the cost of any actions. There's numerous cases where landlords are ultimately the duty holders, but they try to pass the costs of maybe surveys um, and the, the cost of managing asbestos to, um, um, to the tenants. But again, equally, we've got to look back at who is responsible for uh, the maintenance of the, uh, the building. Um, duty holders, um, in some cases, the duty holders may sit at the top of the hierarchy within the organization. 
But what they cannot do is they cannot pass on their legal responsibilities. Um, they can, however, delegate the responsibilities. Um, but if they do nominate other people to uh, take on that responsibility, um, then, of course, they must provide adequate resources. And the person who does become that responsible person, they also need to be competent uh, to do this work. Competence is another question we can answer another day. However, um, it's often referred to uh, in some guidance documents as the appointed person. Some of you may often uh, refer to this role as the responsible person. Very, very similar to if you are dealing with Legionella, there may be a, a key duty holder, but there may also be a responsible person. Again, a similar one is uh, regarding um, fire assessments and the management of fire. Um, I often get asked, um, how can we de determine who the duty holder is in very large organisations? As we've looked at previously, the um, smaller organisations, the um, owner occupier, it's very easy to obviously define that. But of course, what we need to think about, and I've, I've, I've developed this over a number of years with lots and lots of different clients, is try to allocate who's responsible for certain parties that may be um, likely to come into contact with asbestos during their day-to-day -day work activities or within the within the buildings. So if we look at maybe, I don't know, a good example of this might be an NHS trust or a, a very, very large organisation. If we first consider who is likely to come into contact with asbestos, um, maybe on an estate's, um, estate's department where they have inter internal contractors, who are regularly um, disturbing the fabric of the building, carrying out day-to-day -day maintenance works. Uh, but of course, not all that work can be done internally. So in, on occasions, they may have to outsource that to external contractors. In addition to that, there may also be the emergency services that may arrive. And we could also add to that with regard to maybe utility services um, who may also have to visit to carry out utility works. So that would, that would certainly tie us up with the... Um, the maintenance side of the uh, of the organization and unfortunately the duty to manage does tend to sort of target people responsible for maintenance and to try to consider the maintenance contractors being protected in such situations however there are a couple of other people we need to also maybe think about that we have a responsibility to manage uh, the asbestos for and of course make sure their exposure to asbestos is also prevented such as employees so these would be uh, employed by the uh, by the organisation, but not necessarily carrying out maintenance work activities. But of course, they do work in the fabric of the building, and then of course visitors who may also arrive. So, if we were to try and allocate that all that uh, responsibility to maybe the duty holder, who is overall responsible for all of those parties um, potentially likely to come into contact with asbestos. Um, it's very, very difficult for maybe CEOs, COOs, MDs of organisations to um, be responsible. Obviously, they'll have the responsibility, but to actually allocate um, sort of the, the, the roles of the duty holder to um, <clears throat> individuals such as, uh, such as on screen. <coughs> Excuse me. So we can break that down um, further by maybe allocating the appointed person. So, for example, if we refer to an NHS trust, we might find that the duty holder being the, um, uh, the COO or the CEO, so I was, excuse the typo there, the dusty holder, I don't know what's happened there, it should be the duty holder, um, but that appointed person might be the estates manager and that estates manager responsible for the maintenance and contractors, external, internal and external. So the bottom three on the left there, um, that would obviously be the role of the, of the estates manager to protect those, organ those uh, individuals, whereas does the estates manager ha actually have any control over employees within uh, the workplace? And in some cases, they possibly don't. So that may well be the business manager. So responsible for the operation of the business, the staff, the visitors, etc. The business manager might also have uh, an appointed person's role or maybe an assistant uh, to the appointed person, ultimately ensuring that the role of the duty holder is obviously disseminated down to these appointed persons, allowing them to be uh, responsible for their own uh, in individuals they employ or um, their direct uh, direct uh, contractors, shall we say. Um, there's various cases like this, and if I use a, a, an NHS trust as a very good example, um, a, a doctor or a nurse wishes to have their, their shelf put up obviously in their offices uh, the first point of contact there is to go to the estates manager but of course there's a cost implication there's a cost code and it comes out of their budgets so the individual employee might choose to ignore the estates office to do the work and they might engage maybe uh, their husband or their, their wife or their partner to come in over the weekend and obviously 
um, install that shelf, possibly drilling holes, disturbing asbestos and potentially exposing themselves and other people to it. So, so other people who are responsible for the visitors, employees do have an element of responsibility uh, to assist in these cases. So if we can uh, sort of try to sort of target who the duty holder is, as we've already discussed, we then got to consider maybe what the duty holders have to do to comply, obviously, with the, uh, with the law. And there's, a, there's a, a, a list laid down in the approved code of practice, and it's been um, in place now for many, many years. Um, one thing they do have to do is take reasonable steps to identify asbestos within their premises and, of course, check that condition. Now, that could be done quite simply by maybe engaging an asbestos surveying company who may come in and do an inspection and do a survey. Um, where obviously they haven't identified asbestos, uh, they have to presume that asbestos is within those buildings unless there are strong evidence that they're not, such as if it's a building product which we know definitely doesn't contain asbestos. Uh, they'll have to put a written record together of the location and condition of the asbestos and of course keep that up to date. Now the first three that listed there can be quite easily achieved by maybe utilising an asbestos surveying organisation to come in, they will identify the asbestos, that's the first tick, they will obviously make presumptions, that's the second tick, and then of course they'll provide a survey report, which obviously will satisfy obviously the third tick. Um, once obviously they've had their survey carried out, obviously they need to assess the risks um, of anyone potentially becoming exposed to the asbestos, and of course um, assess the, those risks on a regular basis. But more importantly, what they will have to do is put a written plan together, obviously, to manage those risks. Now, that plan obviously has to um, identify the asbestos and, of course, keep it in a good state of repair. So reinspections play a very important part in this. And you may be um, you may be advised in the past that you have to reinspect asbestos every 12 months. Um, that was the case many years ago, and taken out of a guidance document, that is still the case. However, in the latest issue of the um, Control of Asbestos Regulations, it's at periodic in intervals, so it could be every 18 months, could be every two years, but that does depend on the on the risk associated with that. Depending on that uh, that reinspection, they may have to remove, they may have to repair. Depends on how likely it is people are likely to come in contact with asbestos. And of course, the ultimate aim is to protect people from becoming exposed. Probably the most important part of the management plan is to inform on the location and condition of the asbestos containing materials. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so anybody who's likely to disturb. So if we looked at the previous slide where we looked at the internal, external and the emergency services, state's manager obviously were responsible for that. But of course, it does state there that anybody who's likely to disturb. So this could be other employees, could also be visitors um, to the premises. Um, domestic rent rented uh, premises, I mentioned earlier, um, the duty to manage asbestos applies to non-domestic premises. It does not apply to uh, domestic rented premises. It's very difficult for uh, organisations, housing associations, local authorities to manage what goes on in their, uh, their domestic properties. But it does uh, include uh, common parts and those common parts such as uh, foyers, corridors, lifts, lift shafts, staircases. There's a list there on the screen. Um, so of course Although housing associations and local authorities with blocks of flats, the individual flat doesn't have to be um, uh, identified to manage the asbestos. There may be other legislation. There certainly is under the control of asbestos regulations that require it to be identified, but it certainly does need to be managed on a periodic, uh, periodic basis. However, it does apply, obviously, to... Um, the common parts as we mentioned but if you do have clients who have uh, HMOs housing multiple occupations again the shared facilities such as the bathrooms kitchens and dining rooms obviously um, it does not apply to those however the corridors um, and the common parts it would obviously uh, apply to so although we have regulation 4 which is the duty to manage asbestos in non-domestic premises uh, um, the domestic pres uh, premises is not required to be uh, managed. However, don't forget there's other, other legislation such as the Health and Safety Work Act if we're sending contractors in there um, and more importantly Regulation 5 of the Control of Asbestos Regulations which states that before any building maintenance or refurbishment works is undertaken then of course the area needs to be determined if there's any asbestos um, within that work area. Now, the HSE have put quite a lot of detail uh, information about uh, management of asbestos. Um, this was further added to in the uh, latest sort of um, post-implementation review of the control of asbestos regulations in 2012. 
which highlighted that um, people maybe still don't understand the responsibilities and what to do to actually manage asbestos. And I know IOSH have um, released some information, some flowcharts produced by the uh, by the health and safety executive. So there's obviously plenty of resources out there. Um, the following chart that you see on the screen um, highlights obviously um, what premises are defined as domestic and what premises are not. Um, I'm not. I'm not going to um, spend too much time going through this. Obviously, this is um, this is taken off the HSE's website, so feel free to uh, access that and have a look at that. But um, if we look on the left, private houses, you can see they're all domestic houses converted into flats. So the common parts on the right hand side, third one up from the right, you can see obviously that is not a domestic premises. Therefore, there is a requirement to manage the asbestos. Um, this is a, an A4 sheet, so I've broken it down into two screens for you. Um, sheltered accommodation is another interested one. So the private rooms and the communal rooms, so the dining rooms and lounges, they're all classed as uh, domestic, whereas obviously the work areas where maybe there's staff cooking in the kitchens and boiler rooms, etc., and uh, roof spaces, they would also be classed as non-domestics. But you can view that, I'm sure, um, at your leisure. Now, one of the key uh, parts of asbestos management is obviously to have that management plan um, in place. Now, to manage asbestos, um, what does it actually mean to manage asbestos? And these are some of the very, very common phrases we often hear um, from clients who um, believe that they are actually managing asbestos. And um, the first one, all I need is a survey. So if we have an asbestos survey, champion, that's fine. It's not a problem. We've got our information. We're obviously managing asbestos. Um, it's not a requirement to survey. It's a requirement to manage um, all we need to do is just tell the contractors where it is and we are managing asbestos. Now there is some, some truth in that to say the least, but of course um, we need to obviously think maybe about uh, the reinspection part of it. Um, I have an asbestos policy. Um, some organizations will have asbestos policies. That's fine. That tells us obviously we're managing asbestos. Uh, it's, that's not the case. Um, policies I'll come to in a second or two. Um, I have a management plan. Um, I've seen many, many management plans in my time. Um, they do tend to be fairly generic in most cases, but not necessarily specific. And what they should be is specific to the asbestos that's been identified. This is what we hear. Um, is it enough? In most cases, it possibly isn't. So what I've tried to do here is to break down um, the sort of three key documents that organisations do tend to have with their view that they are actually uh, managing asbestos within the, uh, within the building. So the first one is the survey report, tells us what it is, where it is, how much the condition, and of course there'll be an element of risk assessment to determine the fibre release. The management plan should detail what we are doing, who is doing it, uh, when are they going to do it and when they did it. So there is an actual record there. Uh, and then we come across other parts of the management plan, which are key to managing asbestos. Uh, the key one is the register. Um, what we need to do is we need to make sure, obviously, we um, take the details out of the survey report and drop them, obviously, into an asbestos register. We then take that register and develop that into an action plan, which tells us what we're going to do, who is going to do it, when they're going to do it, when they did it. And then more importantly, also the communication plan. So, of course, we now know what we've got. We also then need to make sure everybody is aware of where it is and make sure they are uh, aware of the dangers associated with it. My question is the policies. Um, what is asbestos? Why is asbestos a problem? And of course, how many deaths there are each year, what the law says, what are we going to do about it? So I do tend to find policies that organizations put together are really telling us what we are going to do. Uh, my opinion of that is we know what you're going to do because obviously it's a legal requirement. And as such as a legal requirement, we have to do it anyway. So do we really need policies to sort of tell us what the law already tells us what we've got to do? Uh, the, sec the, the, the middle section of that slide is uh, key but of course we can develop the survey report into the register. And then of course, from there, we can actively manage asbestos. Um, the next few slides talks about the management plan, um, how it should be prepared, um, should set out how the risks are identified and the details should identify the person responsible for managing the asbestos. So is that the duty holder? Do they have an appointed person? And more importantly, a copy of the register um, needs to be accessible if it is kept electronically. Um, hard copies are still being used on site and there's nothing wrong with that as long as they are accessible and they are readable. Um, instructions that any work on the fabric of the building cannot start, making sure obviously that the um, register is actually checked. And of course, uh, the plan should include details for how this will be achieved. Is it um, by signing off? Is it to say 
yet we've checked the register we did all to make sure obviously that people are understanding the information um, within the register uh, checks we made that the information has been understood and that uh, that will need to be uh, taken into account and of course how we make sure that people do understand that uh, make sure obviously the correct um, organizations carrying out works on asbestos are suitably trained and competent uh, with regards to licensed versus non-licensed and then of course plans for any necessary work identified from risk assessments do we need to remove it do we need to protect it uh, is it just a repair or do we just need to uh, to re-inspect it <clears throat> Uh, to make sure obviously it's still kept in a good state of repair. Uh, plans for any necessary repairs uh, to protect or remove the asbestos containing materials. The schedule for monitoring, so is this going to be done every 12 months in accordance with uh, a guidance document HSG 227. It's a few years old now, um, but uh, periodic um, intervals will suffice. Uh, how we're going to communicate that management plan and then of course uh, if the main person responsible for the asbestos is not available who is available is there a deputy um, is somebody else going to act in the role of the uh, duty holder the duty holder should ensure obviously that the plan is implemented um, and make sure obviously that they prioritize the actions identified this is done by way of assessments priority assessments and material assessments um, and of course give high priority to those products which do have uh, a potential high risk to um, uh, visitors and individuals within the premises and contractors. If obviously duty holders are unsure how to implement a management plan, there's plenty of advice out there. Unfortunately, most of these organisations, consultants, etc., will charge for that. Um, you could consult the asbestos survey if you've had a survey they'll be happy to assist uh, UCAS laboratories a um, lot, lot of knowledge there that obviously they can assist you with uh, how to implement the, uh, the duty uh, duty to manage in the plan um, you could even ask your licensed contractors be very brave doing this because licensed contractors remember they um, they earn their living out of lice, uh, asbestos removal and what we don't want to find is that the recommendation is to remove all the asbestos that's not the requirement the requirement is to manage the asbestos and prevent uh, people from becoming exposed or other competent persons um, as appropriate. The plan should include uh, procedures and responsibilities uh, to ensure the register is shared. Um, it's not a case of just let's put it on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the desk and leave it there collecting dust. It needs to be used. It's a fluid document. It needs to be updated. And, of course, it should include drawings uh, for the life, entire life of the premises. So any removal, that also needs to be recorded, who did it, when it was done, and, of course, records showing it was done um, suitably. Work should only start if the duty holder is uh, satisfied with the information. If there's any doubt in the duty holder's mind, then they may need to question the validity of the information. Uh, more importantly, make sure that uh, the information is known and very much understood. We do tend uh, to find organisations will uh, ask contractors to sign a document to say they've read and understood it. It is very important. Don't just assume they have understood it. Just because they have looked at it, they need to uh, they need to make sure they've understood exactly where the asbestos containing materials are. Uh, remembering that um, contractors plumbers, carps, electricians who you are employing, they should really be able to assist you in managing the asbestos uh, within premises. Uh, as a minimum, the management plan needs to be reviewed every 12 months, making sure those uh, same people are in post. Obviously, lots of organisations do have um, they do have sort of restructures on a regular basis and of course that role that individual might not be in post anymore um, that doesn't necessarily negate the need to still manage the asbestos so by reviewing the management plan um, every 12 months we hopefully highlight um, any emissions there the plan including records and drawings should also be updated accordingly any suspected asbestos containing materials um, the condition needs to be ass assessed periodically as I, as I mentioned earlier previously it used to be every 12 months However, um, for example, if we find that we've got some asbestos in a, a very remote location, um, it's in a good state repair, the chance of people coming into contact with it is very low, we may be able to extend that. Um, a good example of that would be the bitumastic pads under stainless steel kitchen sinks. Um, we could possibly extend that to every, uh, every two years, for example. It does depend on the uh, location and, of course, the chances of people coming in contact with the asbestos um, within, those, within those areas. The plan needs to be communicated. Um, they should share uh, and should ensure the information um, of the management plan is made available to individual premises. So if there's managers on sites, they need to make sure they're aware of the information. They will also, again, assist the um, 
duty holder in uh, in managing the asbestos as well. Um, duty holders should tell employees what the management plan arrangements are. Again, we do tend to find that uh, it's only the trade operatives that do get that information. However, all employees likely to come into contact with it um, should be aware. We do tend to find in the past that asbestos is uh, um, sort of a bit taboo. Uh, nobody wants to talk about it. If we just don't mention it, nobody's aware of it and there's not going to be a problem. Um, honesty is obviously going to be the best policy in that sense. Uh, we need to provide the emergency services with information on the location um, so that when they do attend a shout that they are told that there is asbestos within those premises and of course as such uh, if they do find themselves contaminated they would obviously then be able to decontaminate their um, their protective clothing and provide copies of the management plan for employees representatives and trade union um, safety representatives so obviously we've looked at the duty holder uh, and possibly the appointed person um, how can you cater help with that well there are two uh, training courses that you cater offer um, some of their members will offer these courses the first one on the left there is the appointed person that's a three-day course uh, that provides delegates with the practical skills in identifying asbestos and of course managing asbestos and one of the benefits of that that course in particular is to get the delegates to actually develop an asbestos management plan it's looking at the register looking at the action plan and looking at the uh, communication plan and um, as a provider of that we do find the feedback from that is very positive because what they've had in the past is policies and um, generic documentation etc for those assisting duty holders or the appointed persons there is a one day overview course of that uh, that provides delegates with basic understanding um, and it will cover aspects of things like surveys what the management plan is in place for and of course how that needs to be implemented and of course we've concentrated on the duty to manage and management of asbestos um, one thing that might be able to assist you in identifying asbestos obviously is the asbestos surveys now we have a guidance document for this the guidance document you can see on the screen there is asbestos survey guide replaced the old mdhs 100 document um, that came out in february 2010 and of course it brings the client into into that fold as well and it's not just the um is not just the, sur the surveyor there are some uh, key part parts of that um the one of the key boxes is what should be involved in a, a management survey and of course in some cases we do tend to find lots of these no accessed areas so it is worth a read and uh, to read the relevant section on that uh, things to consider when appointing uh, the asbestos surveyor uh, the competency of the surveyor <coughs> excuse me not 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 just the company um, i think you need to assess the competency of the actual surveyor who's going to be doing the work um, many surveying companies will send out somebody to price the survey up have a look at it but we need to make sure that whoever's doing that survey will obviously be competent to do so uh, are they accredited do they have ucas accreditation to offer asbestos surveys now the hsc strongly recommends ucas accredited surveyors uh, but they don't need to be accredited um, at the end of the day what you should be asking for is the survey needs to be done in accordance with hsg 264 and strictly speaking if it's done in accordance with hsg 264 then of course whether they've got ucas accreditation or not it's all about the data it's all about the the validity of the data and of course more importantly the um, information is accurate and um, we're not getting these uh, spe specific exclusions uh, caveats uh, will there be any caveats these are exclusions i.e what are they uh, not going to do for us we tend to find these at the end of the survey we do need to really ask for these at the beginning of the survey because it gives the client the opportunity to maybe uh, eliminate some of those caveats um, one thing we do tend to find a lot of surveys is this no accessed areas um, why do we find these um, the problem is with no accessed areas it might be the keyholders not available it might be there's a safety issue accessing lift shafts or working at heights etc but again if we if we knew what these no access areas were likely to be at the beginning of the commission of the survey we could hopefully eliminate those no access areas a good example of that is if a, a lift shaft is not inspected it's a no access area and as such that area then becomes classed as a, an asbestos area and then of course we've got all manner of risk assessments we need to think about before we allow those lift engineers in so we want to try to eliminate those as much as we possibly can and then of course what type what type of survey do you want and why do you want the survey is it just to comply with the management 
or are we doing refurbishment surveys? So currently stated in HST 264 was two, two surveys we have, uh, the management survey and the refurbishment and demolition survey. Sometimes the refurbishment and demolition survey is broken down into two. So we could argue there are three surveys. So the management survey is the standard survey that would hopefully locate the asbestos. They will take samples and they may make some presumptions and it, um, it, uh, it, it, is, it is an intrusive survey. It's not necessarily fully intrusive, but they do need to access ceiling voids uh, underneath carpets. And if I was to quote box four taken out of HST 264, which most clients are not aware of, um, it does also include lift shafts, uh, riser ducts, uh, underfloor service ducts, etc. These do tend to be found to be no accessed areas. But again, if we can highlight that the initial um, con um, conception of the survey, then we can eliminate those. Uh, the refurbishment and demolition survey, this is a full access. It should be fully intrusive. It will be uh, break into the fabric of the building. Uh, there will be disturbance. There shouldn't be any exclusions. However, obviously we've got to take into account the safety of the surveyor and of course the structural integrity of the building. So it might be that that survey is phased into two surveys, um, but that again will be uh, decided with the uh, client and of course the surveyor. So to conclude, um, you should be more familiar with who the duty holder should be, um, what they have to do, how can they do this, and of course, hopefully I've given you some useful advice when appointing surveyors. Try to get those caveats out at the beginning and eliminate as many caveats as possible. And one thing just to say on the management survey, I've said this for many, many years to many of my clients, is that you should only ever need one asbestos management survey um, if it's done properly. Um, there's no need to have management surveys every 12 months, two years, three years, etc. Refurbishment surveys obviously would be required depending on the refurbishment. So what's next? Removal, the repair. If so, we need to understand um, is it licensed works or is it non-licensed works? Um, this next slide sort of breaks it down very, very um, basically for you. I don't want to spend too much time on it. I don't have a lot of time to spend on this because um, I could talk about this possibly for a good 45 minutes. And uh, Ben's looking at me, looking at my clock here, thinking I need to uh, move this up a bit. So basically, we have two classifications of work. We have licensable and we have non-licensable. Um, so generally, in rough terms, uh, works on sprayed coatings, insulation, laggings, and AIBs, they will generally be licensable works. And the reason for that in the bottom yellow uh, box, you will see that the control limit is likely to be exceeded. Um, if the control limit is likely to be exceeded, those works need to be done by licensed contractors. Um, what will they have to do? They'll have to notify the HSE. Um, that's on what's called an ASB 5. They will have to give 14 day statutory notice on that. There may be some um, waivers uh, requested on that, but that will be for part two of this um, this webinar. Uh, they will have to have a medical uh, by an EMAS doctor. EMAS is Employment Medical Advisory Service doctor and they will get a certificate. And then they will obviously have to keep exposure records for uh, their employees for 40 years up to the age of 80 due to the latency periods regarding asbestos exposures. Now there's a couple of exemptions for AIB for maintenance works. They are uh, if the work can be done in one hour and seven days by an individual such as drilling holes, uh, maybe removing a small asbestos insulation board panel as long as they can do that within one hour but they can't then do any more for a further seven days. Uh, and two person hours on that particular job. So if we had um, say four people um, in theory they could do 15 minutes uh, sorry a half an hour each 30 minutes each um, so their individual time won't exceed an hour but of course uh, the total time won't exceed two personnel. I always find the exemption uh, or the, the uh, short duration works um, a bit of a um, uh, you love it or you hate it. Uh, be very careful with uh, AIB. My advice generally is any AIB work should really be done by licensed contractors because of the risks associated with it. That moves us to the green boxes. These products here um, generally will be considered to be uh, non-licensed works on the provider. The control limit won't be exceeded. And then non-licensed works gets broken down into two phases. So we have non-licensable works. So there's no notification, there's no medical required, there's no record keeping, and there's no HSC. And that's been the case for many, many years in this, uh, in this country. However, due to the amendment to the 2012 Control of Asbestos Regulations and the EU Directive, which uh, enforced us to bring in a further requirement, uh, we also have uh, uh, notifiable non-licensed works. Now, obviously, if the product is degraded or it will be degraded during the work activity, there's a greater risk there. So the works have to be then notified. That's notification is to the HSE again electronically on an ASB NNLW1 form. 
Uh, that has to be done before the work starts. So it's no, there's no 14 day period there. So of course, um, somebody could actually complete the form on site and then obviously uh, carry on with that work activity. There is still the 40 year record keeping very similar to licensable works. In addition to that, they will also have to have a medical, slightly different medical because the medical is a three year medical done by a GP. Um, the first three years of the control of asbestos regulations, they, uh, they had a, a grace period up until May 2015. Obviously, we're now 2018. That grace period has obviously expired. So that just gives you a quick uh, insight as to what is licensable, what's non-licensable. Part two of the seminar, um, we'll go into that in a bit more detail. And of course, it will look at if you are appointing licensed contractors and non-licensed contractors, obviously what, uh, what, what they need to do and what uh, due diligence checks uh, clients need to make uh, when appointing those individuals so i'm good to my time it's 45 minutes thank you for your time and uh, any easy questions would be uh, welcomed excellent <clears throat> okay uh, thank you very much for that graham that's fantastic uh, uh, a lot of content there as well we do have some questions uh so we're going to go into the questions before we do i'm just going to quickly launch a poll just for, for you to answer just a few a uh, few feedback questions uh if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments between now and the end of the session just to just to respond and submit those back to us uh, that'd be great that should uh, appear on your screen now um so we'll, we'll go through the questions then. So to start with, um, we've got a question here. Uh, who is the duty holder in a sublet building? So for example, the owner lets a building, uh, uh, the tenant then lets a building as an HMO. It's got to come back down to who's responsible for the maintenance. So what you need to review there is any contractual obligations you have. Um, if the landlord is subletting and then the tenant is then subletting, is that uh, end uh, tenant obviously going to be responsible for the day-to-day -day. it's a simple one really if something goes wrong maybe in the common parts of a HMO such as the um, the emergency signs fail um, who, who who's that person going to be contacted to arrange that work so the person generally who is arranging that works would obviously be argued to be the appointed person or duty holder in that example okay great uh, there's actually um a few questions uh, around the same uh, same topic here. Uh, with regards to the L143, which states in paragraph uh, 143 that the management plan should be reviewed as a minimum uh, every 12 months, uh, which is different to what you have said. Um, someone else has also uh, asked a question, um, should uh, basically uh, uh, along the same lines as, as well, that we're meant to check materials at least once a year to make sure they haven't deteriorated. Uh, and when this was queried, with the HSE, uh, they said that you needed to update your AMP annually uh, and also have an up-to-date register to do this, uh, hence why they asked to update it annually. What are your sort of thoughts around there? Could you clarify that? Yeah, definitely. They're quite right. The management plan does need to be reviewed um, every 12 months. But if you read further down that paragraph, it talks about assessing the condition of the ACMs uh, periodically. Um, HSG 227 was, was brought out in 2002, which is a comprehensive guide to managing asbestos. And it still stands, although it's slightly out of date, does actually state every 12 months. But of course, L143, further down that paragraph, it does state about the um, re-inspections and uh, reviewing the condition of the asbestos containing materials. But no, I agree, the, and I did state that in my presentation, that the management plan needs to be reviewed for various different reasons, not just the re-inspections. It needs to be reviewed to, to, to who is in post, is the individual still in post, uh, and of course making sure that the asbestos is being managed according to uh, the timeline as set down. But uh, yeah, the management plan does need to be reviewed every 12 months, but the asbestos materials depending on the condition of them um, it's at periodic in intervals now in some cases it might be every six months it might be every three months a lot of organizations still stand by the every 12 months that's fine but of course it's going to be a risk-based approach so we need to reevaluate maybe the risk assessments and look to look at the condition of the asbestos and the likelihood of people coming into contact uh, with it and that may extend that to 18 months may extend it to two years but it's all it's all going to be determined by the by the risk and the organization as to the likelihood of people coming into contact with it excellent okay hopefully that uh, covers those three um <clears> then <throat> another question here with regards to asbestos surveys uh, is there any published information on how an asbestos surveyor should take samples um on a on a survey 
Yes, uh, HSG 264, um, which is asbestos, the survey guide in there, there's detailed information on how um, samples should actually be taken. Um, they, they still have to apply the control measures. They still have to wet the product down. They still need to make sure the air is isolated where possible or certainly um, move people away from where the samples are being taken. Uh, they should take them carefully, um, which is a frustration on my part because we do tend to find hammers being used to knock holes in walls, but they need to be uh, done in, in such a way because even though they are a surveyor, they are actually undertaking non-licensable works. And of course, as such, the regulations require that they must still have their exposure pre uh, prevented, the spread must be prevented. And of course, um, Regulation 17 goes on to state that they must ensure the air is cleaned afterwards. A lot of cases, they should be um, RPE and PPE'd. Um, in a lot of cases, they aren't. Um, that's their prerogative. But um, it, again, it's a risk-based approach on the surveyors. They will look at maybe something of a low risk and not feel that they need the, um, the RP and the PP obviously to be worn um, during that. My advice is that any asbestos really that's uh, sampled, it should, uh, the RP and the PP should be worn. The control measures must always be used because of the potential fibre release. Okay, great. Um, again, with regards to surveys, for buildings uh, that have been built after 2000, do they need to have an asbestos survey done or is the fact that they're built after 2000 enough? Uh, that should be enough. Uh, 1995, I'll probably get corrected here with um, Irish members, but the CDM regulations uh, dated 1994 came out in 1995. So as, as such, uh, there should be as-built drawings, there should be uh, the building manuals, etc., which to state what building products were being used. And although asbestos was um, ceased to be imported in 2000, 1999, sorry, um, a lot of organisations were um, designing it out for the future maintenance and the future life of that building. Um, We've got to draw a line somewhere here um, because asbestos could be found in buildings built after the year 2000, but the chances of it are very, very slim. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves surveying every building right up until 2018. So the HSC have drawn that line to say that's the cutoff date. We can still come across maybe some small aspects because there was a further ban in 2002 where asbestos was intentionally added to building products and uh, other plant that was still being allowed to be imported. Remember, the European Union never banned asbestos until 2005. So, of course, if we were bringing in plants and, and um, say, building materials from our European colleagues, then they may have still have, have, have had asbestos added to them. So that 2002 may be a further trigger or a further line to move that up. But we have to draw a line somewhere. But as long as we've got the original plans, the original drawings, we should be that should be enough to determine whether the likelihood of asbestos or not. Okay, great. Um, we've actually got a, a, a little bit of a scenario question here. Um, so uh, just, just bear me one second. So uh, this person says that they've had an unusual issue. So they're acting as a contractor on a CDM site uh, with the client retaining asbestos liability. Uh, as part of the site setup, there was a refurb and demolition survey undertaken on the area where they're going to be working. Uh, this was found to be clear of asbestos. However, when the surveyor returned to his car, he noticed that there was some asbestos on the chippings in the car park. Uh, so they notified the client. They cordoned off the areas for which there were uh, three separate um, parts of the car park. Uh, the company uh, has a minimum competency uh, requirement for all st uh, site staff to have asbestos awareness. So all staff were already aware of the risks of asbestos. Uh, they've given all staff on site a toolbox talk to tell them about the issue and how to remind them of the dangers and the control measures. Uh, and they've also got a list of the staff attending on site which will be retained. So the asbestos have been removed by the client. Is there anything else they should be doing? Um, the only other thing to consider, and it would be a requirement, is that if, if it's felt that there was uh, a potential exposure, it's very difficult to quantify what the exposure is, but um, a legal requirement would, would be to record that on the personnel file of the um, site staff, just so that there is a record. One of the requirements of that is to also inform the um, 
the staff as well that there possibly could have been. It is a very, very sensitive subject, um, but of course we still must keep those records. Again, it's outside, um, the potential for fire release from that. We don't know what the product is, so it's going to be very difficult to assess, but I would imagine it's probably going to be very low. It's probably from a um, sort of maybe old refurbishments and um, hardcore that was used and crushed on the site prior to, uh, prior to the, the, the works progressing. Okay, great. Um, a short one here. What training is required for non-notifiable work? Um, right, okay. Uh, I'm assuming you're referring to non-licensable works. Um, non-licensable works um, is often referred to as uh, the category B. We don't use it now. Um, but um, UCATA's non-licensable works is a day and a half training course. We break that down into three phases. The first phase is uh, asbestos awareness. So if people have already got that, within the past six months, then they can go move on to phase two, which would be the theory aspects of it. And then phase three, which obviously the practical one, of the requirements is that they have to undertake practical uh, training, such as wearing uh, RPE, PPE, decontamination, applying the control measures, uh, carrying out certain work activities. Asbestos awareness remembering is, um, is an awareness only. And in most cases, it's an avoidance course. The idea is to stop people coming into contact with it. But if anybody is undertaking small, um, small tasks with asbestos or non-licensed works, then it is the, uh, the non-licensed works training, which is as a minimum. Okay. Um, who is the duty holder when there are multiple businesses feeding up into a PLC? <laughs> um, again, we've got to come back down to the um, the responsibilities of uh, of the the sites and the the, the premises. Now, again, L one four three talks about the person or the organisation. Um, it may well be uh, the, the the PLC. They may have a, a duty holder as the PLC, but again, that needs to be disseminated down to responsible persons, such as appointed persons. However, if within the PLC as a holding company, maybe. And the subsidiaries below that um, are operating um, sort of on their own. Then, of course, there will be uh, a duty holder within that organisation. So you've got to really look at the organogram and the structure of the organisation as to uh, ultimately who is going to be responsible. But as I said, in most cases, the duty holders do tend to be um, the hierarchy, the top of the tree, the CEOs. But they have no knowledge, no uh, active role in in managing asbestos. They they pass that with the sort of responsibility other than the legal responsibility down to the appointed persons, etc. Okay. Um, so another one with regards to competencies, what, what competencies are required for reinspection? Um, well, one of the things they need to understand is, is how the reinspections are undertaken. Um, the, the, the reinspections are undertaken looking at two aspects, the material assessment, the priority assessment. Now, if we break the material assessment down into the four parameters, the four parameters being the product, the condition, the surface treatment, and the asbestos type, the, the first and the last there, the product and the asbestos type are always going to be common. They are not going to change. However, the condition of surface treatment will be subject to maybe change if there's been damage or deterioration, etc. Um, as a minimum, um, I would strongly recommend that they would be uh, maybe doing one of the duty to manage courses to understand the process in how the surveyor got to that assessment score in the first place. So to understand that, then they should be able to understand how the reinspection would be undertaken. So some some level of um, some level of training would certainly be required. Okay, um, if a member of staff conducts an asbestos inspection and finds degraded asbestos or asbestos dust, have they been exposed and does that need to be read or reported? So I just read that again. If a, uh, sorry, staff... if, if a member of staff conducts an asbestos inspection and finds degraded asbestos or asbestos dust, have they been exposed and from a risk assessment point of view, does that need to be read or reported? Um, it's a difficult one and the best uh, answer I can give you is if you go onto the HSE's website and type in HSE Riddle, um, there is a statement there which gives you sort of clear indications of uh, when it needs to be notified under Riddle. And basically, um, the terms are if there's been an exposure which is detrimental to that individual's health. Now, this is very difficult to determine because what was the product? Uh, what state was the product in? How close did they get to the product? What's the likelihood of exposure? And generally, in most cases, um, the HSE go on to give some further guidance that if somebody's been working with asbestos uh, without suitable controls, such as on uh, laggings and boards, etc., that would obviously have to be riddled. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one to answer without knowing what the what 
what uh, the condition of it is, how close they got to it. If obviously they're carrying out inspection, they see something that's damaged, uh, that it wasn't damaged last year, then the chances of them becoming exposed is slim and it's very low. But of course, they would generally, I would think, uh, assess that from a distance. So probably chance of exposure no is it redorable in my opinion i don't think it is because they have, haven't actually undertaken the work um, and actually um, intentionally disturbed the asbestos so rid or really regarding asbestos is more so to try to eliminate people who are um, unknowingly disturbing it or working with them without the suitable controls okay great um who is responsible for designating work as either licensed or non-licensed uh, and how would you classify removal of textured coating from an average room in a domestic dwelling so around sort of four by four meters okay well the responsibility um would be down to the employer so let's say for example we've got um, a building contractor who is um, wishing to remove the ceiling i think you said four meters by four meters um, so that would be the employer's responsibility under regulation, uh, regulation five, they would have to do an assessment under six and put a plan of work together under reg seven. Now, regulation six, as part of that assessment, it does need to determine whether the works is licensable or non-licensable. And that would be based down onto the levels of exposure and, of course, the, uh, the work activity of the product. Now, if it's Artex, um, the latest review of HSG 210, which is the Essentials Task Manual, um, I think it's A28, clearly says that Artex greater than one metre squared as uh, it's not classed as small areas. Therefore, that would normally be notifiable non-licensed work. So there's some good guidance out there. <clears throat> if, you, if you're if um, you not sure as to what is licensable or what's non-licensable, um, if you go onto the HSE's website, look in for the Asbestos Essentials Task Manual. There's lots of information in there. There's a flow chart that you can follow. Um, the trigger point for licensable is lagging spray, spray coatings and boards. And then, of course, the control limit also. That also triggers it as well. Okay, great. Uh, we are pretty much at time. I'm going to ask one final question. Um, any questions? We do still have some questions that have been unanswered. So what we will do is we'll look at these uh, a little bit later and see if we can put some written answers towards those uh, which we can post online. So just as a final question then, um, for any refurb works, do clients prefer to have an R&D survey? Uh, most clients will generally direct um, for a, a refurbishment uh, survey purely and simply because the management survey does tend to be in most cases quite superficial so for example a room they would look at the ceilings which are fixed they look at the walls which are fixed so if their refurbishment works is going to be disturbing the fabric of those walls and breaking into the fabric of those walls the refurbishment inspection or survey will break in there and hopefully that that, that will then be able to identify if there is any hidden asbestos containing materials however it depends on the um, scope of the refurbishment works and depends on the um, scope of the management survey that was carried out for example if the management survey was done sufficiently i.e they've looked above ceilings they've looked into floor voice they've looked into riser ducts then of course if it's minor refurbishment works that information might be suitable remember it's down to the duty holder to determine with the information they've got has to be suitable before they allow that work to uh, to continue but most clients would request one yes Okay, fantastic. Uh, we are going to have to call it a day there. As I said, uh, any un un unanswered questions, we'll, uh, we'll look to try and put some, uh, some written responses together if we can, uh, and we'll be able to supply those to you at a later date. Um, just to reiterate, uh, the, a copy of the presentation will be available um, online uh, as a PDF, as well as a recording of this webinar, which will be uh, emailed out to you uh, over the next couple of days. So you will be able to receive that and, uh, and play it back uh, and, and use it, the presentation. Um, Thank you very much, Graham, uh, for coming and delivering this one. Uh, as he mentioned, we will be doing a, a part two. Um, we'll be looking to either do this as a live one later on in the year or, or a pre-recorded one, but um, I will, I'll inform you of what, uh, what's going to be happening with that. Um, thank you all very much for coming. I hope you found this webinar uh, informative uh, and beneficial. And uh, we hope to see you at future ones. I'll, uh, I'll now be uh, closing the session in the next sort of 30 seconds or so. So you will be sort of thrown out. But uh, again, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Graham, uh, for coming and delivering that. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.